stand to your feet this morning and just um, take a minute to um, put yourself in a mindset of worship and just ask the Holy Spirit to focus your attention today.
done singing songs of praise, of goodness, characterizing God and all of his attributes. And it's so easy to sing these songs without intention. And I know there's somebody in this room feeling like they haven't been able to see God's goodness, his moving, his presence. They're feeling like he's not in in their, their circumstances. But friends, I'm here to tell you this walk is not about faith and, and, and sight. It's not about what we can see and feel. It's about our faith and trusting that God has a perfect and precious plan for each and every one of us. So will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, I just, I place a hand over everybody in this room, whether that be comfort or reassurance that you are with them in every step of their life. I just pray for this moment and this time that we will open our hearts to receive whatever you have for us. I pray all these things in your precious name. Amen. Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren. I just wanted to let you know that our Jerry's Coffee Cart is going to be downstairs every Wednesday for the rest of the chapel. The legacy that you leave has got to mean something to somebody. We got to live for something bigger than ourselves. We're good. We're good. Okay. Can I hear a shot? I want. I want to hear a shout out if you believe that the Kansas City Chiefs are going to win on Sunday. Okay. I want to hear a shout out if you think the San Francisco 49ers are going to win. Okay. (laughs) Okay, easy, easy. That's good. Okay. Who's Okay. It's good. So, who knows Who here knows who was president of the United States in 1953? 1953. Eisenhower. Right. That's the year I was born, 1953, right? Yeah, it's true, yeah. And there I was. Is that a zebra I got going there? It might be a zebra. How about this one? Okay, so I am second generation 
in this country. My grandparents, all four of them, came over uh, just at the turn of the century. <clears throat> uh, they were escaping uh, a genocide that had been going on for almost 30 years. It culminated in 1915 um, of a population a little over a million and a half, million point eight, almost a million and a half Armenians uh, were killed under the Ottoman uh, regime who had ruled that area for some 600 years. Um, all four of them made it safely. The stories are amazing how they made it here. Uh, they made it to Chicago. My dad's parents, my dad was born in this country, first generation, and he lived on the north side, and my mom's uh, parents, the south side. So obviously I grew up not far from Wrigley Field, I became a Cub fan, and my mom was always trying to get me to convert to the Sox, because they were the South Siders. Um, grew up near Wrigley Field, um, spent summers out there. It's where my love for baseball really happened. Uh, there were no lights back then. Uh, the Chicago Bears played. Uh, at, at Wrigley Field. I saw a number of uh, Chicago Bear games at Wrigley Field as well. And uh, I would be the first of our family to go to college. My mom and dad, neither, were in college. I'm first generation college. And I have three brothers. Yeah, good. Yes, I do. Okay, yes. So, the left, the far left, is my brother John. Uh, he ended up going into police work. He was a policeman for almost 30 years, detective, became a detective. I'm the second born, but I was the tallest, almost. So then my brother Mark, who uh, became a missionary in Uganda and uh, became a teacher. And then youngest, uh, brother Greg, the four of us there. Christmas. Yeah. There would always be six of us at the table, and my dad would travel all week. He worked really hard as a traveling salesman. To, my mom was always home taking care of us. And then I found the love of my life, <laughs> Marilyn. <laughs> she brought me. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. Yeah. We went to graduate school together. Uh, she, um, she has a couple master's degrees. She never wanted to leave school. She loved learning and leaving. If I married her at, in the, at school, she'd still be in school if I didn't marry her. She'd have, um, uh, love to learn. I took one look at her and I was struck like with something big hit me. And I knew, I knew that was the one I was going to marry. It took her a while to come, to come along on that. <laughs> First time I proposed, she said, no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready for marriage. So about the seventh time, finally. <laughs> yeah, you can ask her, it was seven times. Yeah. Seven, you know, seven's a perfect number in scripture. So, um, but I knew, I knew she was the one because I remember the first time I told her I loved her. And she didn't quickly say, I love you too, which you're hoping for. Um, but she did say something that made me fall deeper in love with her. She says, but tell me about your love for God. No, that's true, she said. Yeah. So, um, we were married uh, during, during my, my last year of my graduate work. And we've been married 45 years now. Yeah. And it keeps getting better. Yeah. The first year was difficult. And we went to a lot of counseling, and it was, it was a struggle to adjust. But there have been a number of times. But um, every single night before we go to bed, we have a wonderful devotional. Um, his mercies are new every morning. I think it's what 
Those who went to the D.C. trip last year, you were all given that devotional. Do you remember that? Yeah. So we read that together, and then we pray together uh, every night. And we pray a lot for my students. Um, I have a deep, a deep heart um, for this age group. Um, I had never read the Bible growing up. It wasn't until I was a junior in college, I went through a pretty dramatic uh, conversion in college. It was the first time I really read the Bible, and it was the really first time I realized that God is real. That it's just not about, we would go Easter and Chris. we went to church once in a while, but they were just stories. It was an Easter story, it was a Christmas story. Um, I had a very... Uh, strong family. The ethnic, the Armenian ethnic families are very strong. We stay, we stick together. We have to, in a sense. Um, I really appreciated uh, Roger and Heather and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Curry and the others. In fact, I've been coming to chapel for 14 years now. And this fall has been one of my favorite ever. The name of it here from other professors and staff. It's been really rich for me because each of us, God seeks us and draws us in each in a different way from different backgrounds, from different paths. Um, I was fortunate uh, to have a very strong family, not just my parents, but my uncles and aunts. Um, we continued with the Armenian food my mom, we, they stopped speaking Armenian in the house at some point because they really wanted our, they wanted our, you're going, to Eng, you're going to school now. You need to really get the English and all that. So really blessed by this community, by the faculty and staff. Um, you have no idea how important we are to be for each other. Um, it's more than just getting your education. I wanted more than anything growing up to be a major league baseball player. That's all I thought about. I would watch and listen to the Chicago Cubs on w, uh, WGN. Uh, I kept score. I knew every player. I knew their statistics. I studied the game of baseball. I grew in love with the game of baseball at a very young age. Um, played all the way through high school. I went to one of the premier baseball schools in the country at that time. Hundreds of major league ball players have come out of this school. Um, University of South Alabama, a powerful baseball school. Uh, I went, they didn't know anything about me. I wasn't recruited, but I knew where I wanted to go, and I walked on. Um, and I miraculously made the travel squad, <laughs> just barely. <laughs> Um, I found out that the brand of baseball they play in the South down there, um, I couldn't keep up much with it. There were a few players from Chicago. Um, one of our players I got very attached to. I was very lonely being away from my family for the first time. Uh, when, you're, when you're raised with a really strong family, a lot of brothers, sisters, aunts, cousins, uh, Every holiday, we're always together. Uh, we always care in that way. When you're away from home, uh, I really was very deeply lonely and homesick for a lot of my time there. But I grabbed on to one of the other Chicago players. He was one of the starters. And this was the late 60s, early 70s. So drugs had... Uh, infiltrated the campuses. They just were, they just, the campuses were overtaken by drugs. And I'd never, ever, never did drugs in high school, didn't really drink. I was all concerned about playing ball. But I got involved with the wrong people. I got involved with the drug culture there. And <clears throat> I ended up 
overdosing in a big way. There was, we took LSD, we took Quaalu, anything you want to imagine, we were involved. And the coaches didn't, we didn't think the coaches knew about it, but I'm sure they probably did. Um, and I was arrested for disorderly conduct that night. Um, and guess who had to bail me out? The two coaches, my head coach and the assistant coach. The head coach was a man by the name of Eddie Stanky. He played Major League Baseball for 12 years. With, he was with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and he managed for about 12 years. He was an icon down there. He'd make Chevy commercials on the ball field. And I really pretty much disgraced him and uh, the team because it all came out in the news. I was, they didn't let me write out. They took me to a psychiatric ward in the hospital, and they put me on suicide watch. I mean, I was really messed up. The disorderly conduct was interesting because there was a group on campus. There was a group on our campus called Delight, a group of, of young women who are going deeper with Christ, right? Well, there was a group on campus pretty much like that, and they were praying for the athletes, and they were praying for me specifically for some reason. Um, and the night I really kind of flipped out, I don't know if that's a word you use today, kind of completely gone, I went to one of the apartments where about four of them lived, and I started banging on their door because I wanted to know um, what was going on. Because something, something was drawing me to that, to that place. And so I dropped out of college. Um, went to live with my grandparents in California. Learned more Armenian again. And I remember one night, I felt the presence of God like I've never felt it. I didn't even know the presence of God. I didn't even know there was a God. I just know that I was so, I was not at peace. And I remember praying. I didn't know if I was praying to the ceiling or what. I said, God, if you are real, please let me sleep tonight because I couldn't sleep at night. I was, my whole system was messed up. I never had a good night's sleep since all of that happened, since I left, left school. I said, if you're real, please, I need some peace. I need, some, I need to sleep. And that night, I, it was the first night I really had sleep, a peaceful sleep. And I woke up, and I knew God was real. And I knew Jesus was real. And I started reading the Bible immediately. I went back to school. I was allowed back on the team. And I was actually able to graduate in four years because I, I, I studied two summers down there in Alabama, which is not something you want to do. <laughs> Alabama's hot in the summer and humid. And I played ball in the summer and I did my schoolwork. And my grades went from around D's all the way to A's. I started making straight A's. No? No? That's <laughs> There's a, can you hear the grace that's being involved in, in what I'm saying? The, the goodness of God overwhelmed me. I knew I was loved. And I just had a whole different attitude about school. Sports was important, but it wasn't the thing anymore. Jesus was the only one I wanted to live for. Because he literally, he literally saved my life. I wouldn't be here. Um, he literally saved my life. Um, graduated with a B average, above a B average. It's not great, but it was better than where I was. And then I went off to seminary. I studied, and I was ordained for 30-some years, um, preaching and teaching. 
And I've learned something over the years that what I think I know about Jesus and about his love keeps growing more and more for me in intensity. It's not a new type of revelation. It's a deep place of revelation um, that he first reached for me when I was out visiting my grandparents that evening where I knew God was real. And so I came to Judson University about 14 years ago. I had retired from pastoring. I retired from coaching high school baseball. I had coached high school baseball for 16 years while I pastored. And Rich Benjamin, who was the head coach, asked me if I would be his assistant. And I coached for 12 years, full time, every trip, every practice, for 12 years here. <laughs> and I know what it means to be uh, a, a student athlete. I know, I know what, you need, what you go through here. And then about five years ago, I was asked if I would consider teaching, which I never thought about. And I told the chair of the department I wasn't really interested in that. I just wanted to coach. The third time he asked me, um, he said, you better see what the Lord wants in this. And one thing I've discovered is we all need to have a deep purpose for our lives. We're created with that. We have to have a deep purpose. And there's a void until that happens. And sometimes that purpose gets filled with things like relationships and uh, vocation and jobs and things and all kinds of stuff. We try to fill that. But until it's filled with the one we're created for, um, we'll continue to be without rest. I wish I knew this back then, but I'm growing in this. Without Jesus, I have no idea the truth about who I am or who God is, because he is the truth. Without Jesus, I have no idea the truth about my life, its purpose, its significance, my identity, I have no idea about a relationship that I'm created for without Jesus. And so without Jesus, we have to come up with our own truth because we still have that need. We have a deep need to know my value, my significance, to really know who I am, my identity, and to have, give myself to some purpose. So we make our own truth. That type of truth always needs others to make it happen. I need, if I need to feel significant, apart from the relationship with God, I need you to give me that significance by what I'm doing. I need the purpose to be involved horizontally. But I discovered in Jesus the goodness of God, my significance, my value to God, my identity as one of his children. That's the legacy I hope I can leave for my family and for the students I teach, to continually point them to the one by whom and for whom they were created. One of the lies the enemy told Adam and Eve in the garden was pretty much this. You can find the truth about your life 
you can find the happiness you were meant for. You can find who you are apart from the creator. You just have to grab, grab for it. You can find it all on your own and for yourself. Apart from the creator. I just want to share one scripture with you. I journey with you. I journey with you in our relationship with God. And there's nothing more important in my life than that relationship. My greatest need in life is that that relationship with God in Jesus Christ is happening. And my biggest problem in life is when that doesn't happen. Jesus solved your greatest problem and fulfilled your greatest need. Your greatest problem is that separation from the one you're created for and the one you're intended to know and love. And the greatest need of your life is that you would be in that relationship. Jesus makes that all possible. That's why we call it grace. I can't make it possible. The Christian faith is not a religion. A religion is what we do to make that possible, to try to get something more out of life, some type of happiness or peace or fulfillment, try to make something of a relationship with the God who creates us. That's religion. Christianity is a gospel. It's what God has done to restore it. And faith is simply my response to it. It's my yes. It's I'm yours now. It's one of the most powerful prayers you can pray in the morning when you wake up. Abba, Father, I am yours. I have no other but you. And I want this day to give myself fully and completely to your son, Jesus Christ. I want to live out of a life that he paid for on the cross. That's the life I'm intended to live. We're born into a place, a life that God never intended. That's why Jesus said you must be born again if you enter the kingdom. Jesus' death on the cross provides the way into that relationship because his death removes everything that hindered the relationship, our sin and our death. There's my son Thomas, birthday. <laughs> We're both um, digging into the cake together. Okay. <laughs> son Thomas. Okay. A couple years ago, he was married to Talin, good Armenian girl. <laughs> I just want to look briefly at this passage from Ephesians. For me, when I pick up the scriptures, there are certain passages I go to that so illumine God's love for me and the relationship Jesus desires and what his suffering death makes of my life now. That who I've become because he died and rose again who I'm becoming because his very present Holy Spirit is working grace in my life to bring me fuller into the life he paid for. And this passage from Ephesians, you were, notice the past tense here, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you, past tense again, once lived. 
See what Paul's saying here. There was a life we all lived, Paul's including himself, that was separated from the life God always intended. Following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient, all of us once, there's the past tense, he's talking about another life he lived. Apart from what the cross has accomplished. We all once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were, past tense, by nature, children of wrath, like everyone else. We all participate in that being separated from who we're meant to be. But God, anywhere you're in your Bible and it says, but God, it's time to really look and pay attention because something of goodness and grace is coming. Because without God, there's no hope. But with God, but God who is what? Rich in mercy out of, it doesn't say the love, the great love with which he loved us. That what happened to me back in college, the big thing that turned my heart to Christ was his love and his goodness had just come upon me. Even for the awful, terrible thing I'd done to, to others and myself, he still, his love came upon me. The great love which he loved us, even, catch it, even, even when we were dead, without hope, without the relationship, without the love that we needed so desperately, trying to get it from others, but always coming up short and needing it again and again. We were dead through our trespasses. He made us alive together with Christ. That's the new birth. That's what grace does. That's what Jesus Christ accomplished through his dying and rising and then bringing the very presence of himself within us. By grace, you have been saved. By grace, you have been saved. When I struggle with life at times, these are my go-to passages. I've got a whole bunch of them. They're all highlighted in my Bible. It highlights something about who God is. When my circumstances are speaking differently, it speaks about who God is. I came to one of the most difficult times in my life. If you notice the picture, there's a Christmas tree in the back. Can you see the Christmas tree? This was Christmas of December 25th, 1984. Wonderful, the whole family was there. The next day, December 26th, 1984, my brother Greg, the one on your far right, died suddenly. It was called the sudden death syndrome. Sometimes he was very athletic. We didn't know he had a congenital heart problem. It just, it just happened immediately. He was preparing to meet with his friends. They were going backpacking in the Rocky Mountains. Met him at the airport. He collapsed at the airport. <clears throat> they called us at the house. We went to Resurrection Hospital. The doctor brings us into a room. And he says, I'm sorry, Mr. and Mrs. Atamian, but your son has died. 23 years old. It changed everything for our family. My mom could even celebrate Christmas for the next four or five years. She had to go away. My dad died two months later of a broken heart. And through that all, of course, I had lots of questions. But there's something I never let go of, and that was God's grace. I knew of God's love and goodness. There were people saying, well, if God really loves 
and he's good, why did he let this happen? If God didn't love me, why did he give his son for me then? So I held on, I held on to the truth of his love and the person of Jesus and the life that was going on with me in Christ. But there was this great tension with what was happening to my family. You have to stay in that tension. We can't change who God is by our circumstances. We know who God is because of the cross. And it's powerful and it's always going to be present there. And so sit in the midst of that tension. And I know one day that I'm going to put my arms around my brother Greg. Because our grief is not like those who have no hope. There is a victory, not only over sin, but over what sin causes, death. Father, thank you for our time together here. I pray, I ask that your word of grace and goodness would touch each of us again anew, fresh this day. That we can know Jesus and know the peace he has made through his cross and the life we have with you, Heavenly Father. Bring it alive again this day. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name, and you are dismissed.